Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of Spilling Studio. My name is Sam and this week we have seven new ARE practice questions designed to help you pass your next exam. There's one question per exam topic and a bonus question at the end, so stick around. First up is practice management. An architect has just begun working at a new architectural firm in the city and notice their employee contract makes reference to a restrictive covenant. What does this mean? The employee is not allowed to make decisions for the firm. The employer is not allowed to ask the employee to work overtime. The employee must follow the firm standards when communicating with clients. The employee is not allowed to set up a competing firm in the same city. Feel free to pause here to answer. The answer is, the employee is not allowed to set up a competing firm in the same city. Did this question make you all do a double take? A restrictive covenant? I thought that was just related to property conditions. Nope, a restrictive covenant at an architecture firm is also more commonly known as a non-compete clause, which restricts what an employee can do once they leave a firm. Most firms have this in their employee contracts. Restricted covenants or non-compete clauses can restrict who the employee works for after leaving for a certain amount of time. So it could say you can't go work for XYZ firm for two years after leaving our firm. It can also state whether or not an employee can set up their own firm in a certain area and whether or not they can work for the clients of their previous firm. Like I said earlier, this is very common in our field. I would actually be surprised if your contract did not have a non-compete clause. This is also similar to moonlighting, which is working for another firm or client while you're currently working at a firm, but we'll cover that in another video. Now on to project management. An owner is finalizing the owner contractor agreement for the construction of a new city hall. Since the contract includes a penalty clause, what else must be included? Liquidated damages? Mechanics lien, bonus provision, and incentive clause. Pause here to answer. And the answer is bonus provision. So let's start off with what the heck is a penalty clause. This is a clause that can be included in the owner contractor agreement and it charges the contractor for not completing the work by the date agreed upon in the contract. So let's say the contract says the contractor must be at substantial completion by May 14th, 2027, and the contractor does not reach substantial completion until May 15th, a day later, then the contractor owes the owner some money. Now, in order for this penalty clause to hold up in court, a bonus provision must be provided. A bonus provision is a payment from the owner to the contractor for completing the work before the agreed upon deadline. Having only a penalty clause in a contract is typically disfavored by courts and when they show up alone without a bonus provision, they are almost always unenforceable. So it's always best to include a bonus provision. A better way to cover the owner for the contractor being late is with liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are agreed upon in advance and are based on an estimate of costs or fees the owner will incur if the project is not completed by a certain date. So if the project were a new hotel and the owner is estimating they will lose half a million in rent a day, then the cost would be paid for by the contractor. Now, the actual losses may be less or more, so a reasonable average is typically used. Because maybe the owner is estimating the hotel being 100% full on day one, but the industry standard for a hotel is actually around 70%. Next up is programming and analysis. An architect is in the preliminary stage of site planning for a new community center. Which of the following are effective strategies for sustainability? Select three that apply. Select a rural site. Minimize the building footprint. Select LED lighting fixtures. Position the building against contours. Place the building and parking next to the road. Or select an area for an infiltration basin. Pause to answer. And 
And the correct answer is minimize the building footprint, place the building and parking next to the road, and select an area for an infiltration basin. We have to pay attention to the keywords here, and they are preliminary stage, site planning, and sustainability. There are a few options here that are sustainable, but are not considered during the preliminary stages of specifically site planning. So in the early stages of site planning, we want to look at minimizing the building footprint so that we're not taking up more land than is necessary. We also want to look at placing the building and the required parking as close to the road as possible so we're not paving a long unnecessary driveway and so again we're leaving more land undisturbed. And finally, we want to make sure we're saving space for an infiltration basin which catches stormwater and retains it until it can naturally seep back into the ground, which reduces the amount of stormwater added to the stormwater system. Sam, but why should I care if more water goes to the stormwater system? Well, as cities grow and more land is developed, more water is displaced and needs somewhere to go. If all new development solely relied on the stormwater system, cities would continuously need to upgrade infrastructure sizing to accommodate this. I recently had a project where the city's stormwater pipe was running through the center of our site, so we had a 25 foot easement during initial site planning. But as we moved into construction documents, the city decided to widen that easement to 60 feet because they predicted they would need to add a secondary pipe to accommodate the next five to 10 years of population growth. So that took a bit of redesign on our part. Now adding infiltration basins will not completely eliminate the need to increase utility sizing, but it will help slow down that need. Being able to treat all or majority of your stormwater on site is much better for the environment and the city. You may have small projects that have small sites and it's compact like in an urban area where treating the water on site is very difficult. So you can't always do this, but it's best to when you're able to. Next up is project planning. An architect is working with the city planning department to locate a new elementary school in a growing suburban area. The city is planning on developing two new streets to accommodate the new school. The architect should recommend to the city planning department that the proposed streets be which types. James Street as local, 6th Street as local, James Street as local, 6th Street as collector, James Street and 6th Street as collector, or James Street as collector and 6th Street as arterial. Pause here to answer. And the correct answer is James Street as local and 6th Street as collector. The best street type to access sites or buildings are from local streets. These streets are typically curvilinear and they have a lower capacity and the speed limit is the lowest, allowing cars to slow down and turn into the property. Therefore, it is best that James Street is a local street. Collector streets have a higher capacity and are not typically used for through traffic, which means they're not typically used to get to somewhere else further away. Instead, your destination is accessed by the collector street. Collector streets connect local streets to arterial streets. When collector streets connect to local streets, a stop sign is used at the intersection, and when they connect to arterial streets, a stoplight is used. Since 6th Street is connecting an arterial street to a local street, it should be proposed as a collector street. And finally, arterial streets connect collector streets to expressways. They carry large amounts of traffic around population centers and intersections are controlled by stoplights. A brief pause here to remind you that I post new questions every week, so please hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on a video. It also really helps me out, so thank you. Now on to project development. What type of weld does the following symbol represent? Single fillet weld, single V butt joint, double fillet weld, square groove butt joint. Pause to answer. And the answer is single fillet weld. Before we dive into weld types, let's talk about what welding is and what the benefits are. To put it simply, welding is the process of melting a material and then cooling the materials causing fusion. 
In construction, an electric arc is typically used as the heat source to melt the materials. Once the materials are melted, they are brought together to form a joint. Sometimes these members are simply pressed together, and other times a filler material is used. Welds are often used instead of bolts for many reasons. First, they allow the gross cross section of a member to be used instead of the net section, which makes structural calculations much simpler. Because if you are using a bolt, you would have to deduct the whole opening used for the bolt. They are also more streamlined for construction since there's no angles, bolts, or washers needed and you don't have to worry about clearances for wrenches. And finally, they are best for moment connections. Now, back to our weld types. The welding symbol shown in the question was for a single fillet joint. In this case, from the little graphic, it's a single fillet lap joint since the two materials are overlapping. So how do you remember all these types for your exam? For the most part, what they are named describes the joint that they're connecting, which makes it easy even though it's a bit overwhelming when you're trying to keep a thousand things in your head for the exam. So if you think about it, a V joint welds a gap that looks like a V, a J joint welds a gap that looks like a J, and the same thing with a U joint. And a butt joint joins two members that are butting right up against each other. For those of you who've never used AutoCAD, it may be most difficult to remember the fillet joint, but if you've used AutoCAD, I remember fillet joints by thinking of the fillet command in AutoCAD that gives you the ability to curve a 90 degree corner. So that's how I was able to remember that one. So for studying these, I would say just kind of sit with these symbols and the names and maybe try to think about other things that they remind you of. Um, so that you can recall them quickly when you're testing. Next up is construction evaluation. The contractor of a new office building has just completed the first month of construction and is preparing to submit an application for payment. According to their owner contractor AIA agreement, the amount of routine inch held from each application for payment is 5% of the monthly amount due, 10% of the yearly amount due, 5% of the total contract price, as stated in B101 or as stated in A101. Pause here to answer. The answer is as stated in A101. For those of you who knew the answer was one of the contract answers, I made this one a little more tricky so that you had to know at least what the right document letter is. In the exams, they will ask you questions where you have to pick which contract, but if I remember correctly, they almost always give you the document number and the document name, which makes things a little bit easier. So sorry for making this one tricky on you. This question is asking about AIA document A101, the standard form of agreement between owner and contractor. Under section five payments, there is a small blurb about retainage and the first item listed asks for the retainage amount to be inserted. In almost all of my projects, a percentage of the amount due is used, but they can also insert a specific amount. The amount is typically 10% of the payment application. And when do the contractors get this money back? At substantial completion. Make sure you remember that part for your exams. And finally, our bonus question is, an architect is working on writing specifications for a project in an area with severe weather. What type of masonry mortar should the architect specify for the exterior walls? Type M, type N, type O, or type S? Pause here to answer. And the correct answer is type N. Type N is typically recommended for areas that are exposed to severe weather and high heat. It is a medium compressive strength mortar at 750 PSI and can achieve 28 day strength between 1500 and 2400 PSI. Type N mortar is typically used for exterior above grade walls. Type S is used for at or below grade applications since it has a higher compressive strength of 1800 PSI but some mixes can have even higher strengths of 2300 to 3000 PSI. Type S performs well under soil pressure and in seismic conditions. Type M has the highest compressive strength at 2500 PSI and is typically used for walls with heavy loads or for walls made of a harder stone. 
And finally, Type O has the lowest compressive strength of 350 psi, and therefore it's typically used for interior, non-load bearing walls. Because this mortar has a higher lime concentration, it's more flexible and easy to apply, so it's also often used for tuck pointing. That's our questions for this week. Remember to check out the description for links to some of the AIA contracts covered in this video. I've also linked some of my favorite study books, so go check those out. Let me know in the comments what subject areas you're struggling with, and I'll do my best to cover it in the next video. Thank you all for joining. Please subscribe, and good luck on your next exam. You got this.